Hey everyone, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm here to talk about a project called Protomaps I've been working on for several years now. Um, and the tagline is web mapping at any scale. Um, so Protomaps um, is an indie cartographic stack. Um, so what does that mean? Um, I like to describe it, um, or someone described it to me as an end-to-end -end system for bundling and styling vector web maps using only static files. Um, and this is um, sort of a system that I've been building based on about eight or nine years of building these cartographic projects. And um, it's kind of an umbrella project. Uh, so one principle is that it's like an open source buffet. You might not be interested in using the entire uh, like end-to-end -end system, but there might be some component in it that is useful for your application. Uh, so um, some core values of this project um, that are more like technical design oriented um, is that Firstly, it works the same at any scale. Um, that means that if you have a mapping project that is like your neighborhood on OpenStreetMap, or if you have a civic tech project that is your, uh, unlike your city um, that you live in, or even uh, the entire planet of data, the principles are the same. It's not like when you extend uh, your application to work with the planet, you have to suddenly bring in an, like an entire fleet of servers and databases. Um, so the way that's accomplished is by favoring really simple technology, so static files wherever possible. Uh, favor being modular via established standards, uh, you know, like GeoJSON or like vector tiles um, that are sort of the de facto standard. Um, but also don't be afraid to try something really new. Um, and the way like I think about trying something really new is by taking a systems programming approach, which means um, if you need to reinvent a database or reinvent a format, um, to have sort of optimal data structures for the things you're trying to accomplish. Uh, some core values that are uh, not technical, but more sort of uh, social, like this project out there in the world, um, is as an indie project, um, I can be very hypothesis driven. Um, I don't have to have a defined um, use case in mind. I can be like, is this problem able to be solved in this way? Um, and sort of develop an experiment yeah, I mean, see how that technique works. Um, and I think it's kind of like this faster horse problem we have in GIS especially, where um, like, if you ask people what they want, they want a faster horse. If you ask people how to make uh, their deployment simpler and they're using PostGIS, then it's, you know, put PostGIS in a Docker container and put it on Kubernetes and have like 16 threads that are running all the time to make it work and never about, can we fundamentally re-architect things to be simpler? Um, and uh, the relationship to open source, uh, you know, as an independent developer, um, it's really important that it is open source um, because otherwise people would not have confidence in it. Um, if it's, you know, if it's a bus factor of one, um, then they want to make sure that they have access to the improvements as the project goes on. Um, you know, it's because the other um, technology might have, you know, a big company behind it. Um, and open source is also key to building an audience inclusive of sort of hobbyist and civic-minded use cases, the kinds of applications that can't necessarily pay for Google Maps um, just because they have no budget, they're doing something really sort of socially useful, um, but things like, uh, like geocoding and map tiles are really scarce because uh, of a business model. Uh, so talk overview, um, I'm gonna talk about the three core open source projects. Uh, and sort of the hypothesis I had for why that project should exist, um, talk about whether um, or not they succeeded or failed, and uh, those are all open source. Um, so it's sort of an end-to-end -end system from OpenStreetMap, the open source data set, all the way to a tile format, and finally a rendering system. Uh, so the first hypothesis, um, which if any of you do web mapping, um, is about Leaflet.js. It's a library everyone loves. Um, it's been around for a long time. Um, there are uh, modern competitors to it that are fancier, but there's something about Leaflet that people really love. It has great plugins, um, but it has never rendered vector tiles. Um, so I decided to build a new canvas-based renderer uh, for Leaflet um, that is really lightweight called ProtoMaps.js. Um, and the important thing about this, it is non-real time. Um, it does not do fractional zoom. Um, it's sort of the leaflet experience. When you change zoom levels, it jumps from one zoom level to the next. I think people generally like the leaflet experience. It's good enough for a lot of use cases. Um, one really important thing is it implements labeling. Um, it's fairly decent. It supports things like compound labels with different languages. You can do localization on the client side. 
uh, supports um, actually many more languages than MapLibre because it uses the browser APIs for font shaping. Um, and it is a good enough renderer for a lot of base mapping use cases. Um, one interesting thing is that the styling language is not like um, a sort of embedded in JSON language like in other renderers, but actually TypeScript. So it is extensible and also composable. Uh, so just an example, um, you can also use it as just a leaflet layer. So you might have like uh, the EOX uh, sort of cloudless uh, yeah, on the satellite layer underneath it and just use this renderer to put vector labels or vector tile labels on top possibly localized to a local language. Um, it does um, label layout uh, with no rotation. So those are just axis aligned bounding boxes. Um, what challenges or failures has the project gone through? Um, one thing is I've spent a lot of time working on the engine and not a lot of time working on like themes or open source styles. Um, there's this like game development quip, which is like the best way to never write a game is to write a game engine. Um, so kind of a similar thing where I think what it really needs is some open source styles that people can drop in immediately. Um, in general, I think there, people do have high expectations from using um, Apple Maps, from using Google Maps around real-time rendering, um, fractional zoom, like a really smooth experience you can get with things like open, uh, so things like, like the new open layers GL and also MapLibre GL or Mapbox GL. Um, and if you need map rotation, this obviously won't work because Leaflet just does not work that way. Um, so what do I want to do next with it? Um, focus on differentiating use cases. Um, it's sort of a lightweight renderer in like about 30 kilobytes. Um, do interesting things with custom symbology. Um, build more styles. Here I've uh, sort of ported Stamen's toner design to vector tiles um, in this sort of styling language. Also a really great drop-in if you already have an application that uses leaflet and plugins um, that for, for whatever reason you don't want to migrate to a different renderer. Um, so that's that first project. Um, second sort of hypothesis for a downstream project is about OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is, um, as people know, is a pretty tough uh, data set. And users, they want access to fresh data sets of on-demand areas. So they don't really want to deal with uh, like a national level thing. Maybe they're only interested in one county. And they want to be able to select OpenStreetMap data for that county. Uh, so I built this uh, web service uh, called, it's called ProtoMaps Downloads or ProtoMaps Extracts, and it's backed by an open source database uh, that's called OSM Express. Um, the way it works is you can choose an AOI um, up to about a 100 million node limit, um, and um, it's backed by this transactional embedded database that stores OSM nodes, ways, relations. Um, it can be updated. Um, it uses S2 cells um, if you're, you know, like a geek about spatial indexing. Um, so it's pretty efficient uh, for weirdly shaped areas. Um, there is a free on-demand UI where you can just go download this stuff. Uh, you can download an extract uh, that is totally up to date by the minute. Uh, 15,000 times it's been used. Um, and um, it's also been used as a building block for other OSM infrastructure at other companies. Uh, so what things have I learned about maybe problems with this project, um, still we're in the case where it only outputs raw OSM data and it's still sort of exotic of a format and the audience for that is usually just OpenStreetMap devs. Um, so like if you're feeding that into a tiler or a router or a geocoder, it's pretty useful. Um, but there is a wider audience for, for OSM than that. Um, updated OSM data I've also discovered is not actually like a huge demand among a lot of organizations. If they have like a weekly data set, it's still pretty good enough. Um, it's also a C++ project, so there's some um, packaging I'm trying to improve. Um, so what I'm working on next is to have tabular output out of this, probably in flat GeoBA format, where it can interact with GDAL. Um, and also um, think about adding a way to automate this. So if you have, if you're an organization that needs a dump well, like once a day, then you can just access that area uh, sort of on demand uh, via API. Um, so the third project is called PM Tiles, and this is something that I'll spend most of the time on. Um, and uh, the sort of motivation for designing this was I found that storing and serving read-only web map tiles can be made much simpler than it is um, if we sort of adopt these cloud-optimized principles into tiles. Uh, so one really popular solution in the space is called MB Tiles. Um, it's based on SQLite, which is an embedded database. 
Um, it's quite simple, um, but most people don't really write to it more than once. They write a bunch of tiles into it and then read only from that database. Um, so it's kind of overkill for a lot of use cases. Um, if you want to read, then you need to bring in the SQLite library, which is a C dependency. Um, it can have a lot of duplicate data, which bloats the indexes. Um, so the goal here was to build a sort of next generation of MB tiles, hence the name, um, and uh, make it really compelling by making it a cloud optimized format. Uh, so you might have seen a complex uh, rendering stack that has GIS data sets imported into PostGIS, imported into tile servers, and then there's like load balancing and SSL certificates and processes to monitor. Um, so anyways, like, let's get rid of all that. Uh, so PM tiles, um, or so some people say like, you could just have each one of your tiles individually on S3 in like a ZXY folder. Um, it works pretty well for small tile sets, um, but it's kind of like um, here drinking espresso in like single shots. Like if you wanna like wake up, you gotta drink like a bunch of them because every single time you update like a tile on S3, you're paying some transaction cost for writing. It's gonna take you weeks to upload like a planet scale data set that has like 300 million tiles. Uh, so um, VM tiles is a cloud optimized tile archive. Um, doesn't matter what the tile is, uses range requests. Uh, constrained to ZXY indexing, um, has deduplication, so if you have, you know, 70% of the world is ocean, so 70% ocean tiles are just gonna be stored once and that's it. Um, and uh, direct plugins for Leaflet and also MapLibreGL, uh, you need a pretty recent version to have that right plugin support. Uh, so quick layout, uh, it's a single file, the tile's there, the directory at the front. Uh, so this idea of being scale free is like, you can just upload one file, like a big pot of Americano coffee. Um, just one big thing instead of tons of little things. Um, there might be 10 megabyte, it might be 500 megabytes. Planet scale is like 80 gigabytes. Um, so it's um, a single file that can store an entire tile set and be accessed remotely, uh, so directly to the browser. Um, one use case um, that has come up is somebody has been building an R Studio plugin for this. So for a data scientist using R, um, they don't necessarily uh, want to have to run a tile server to share some data set, but the idea of just putting their, uh, that visualization tile set onto like S3 or another storage provider and being able to share uh, the visualization uh, is really useful. Uh, so the outcomes from this, um, it's, um, pretty, uh, it's gotten a good amount of uptake, um, and I found that it enables new use cases, this model of not having um, sort of an API or a server to talk to. Um, it, it could be shareable notebooks, it could be uh, offline if you're on an airplane um, or in space. Um, and um, the pricing, because it's sort of scaled to zero, like if you're not using it, you're not paying for a server. Uh, so it's affordable for sort of small scale projects and it's already uh, being used for a bunch of different projects. Uh, the big thing is um, I'm at this conference to kind of talk to people to figure out what needs to go into the next spec version. Uh, the motivation is uh, V2 was kind of get it out the door, uh, don't optimize, just get it running on, every, on all the environments. Uh, so you know, server, different languages, Python, JavaScript. Uh, V3 introduces compression, uh, so by default, GZIP for tile data, um, and also compressed indexes. Um, so there's some, like, some overhead with fetching the directory structures uh, for, uh, for each tile request that can be cached. Um, in general, for V2, it was just like, do something really basic, don't compress, like half a megabyte of overhead, um, and with V3, it's generally under 50 kilobytes, so it's an order of magnitude better. Um, also introducing an optional uh, clustering on space filling curves um, that can make certain types of access patterns more efficient. Uh, so um, I wrote a blog post on uh, how this works just so I can justify my design. Um, so uh, inside PM tiles, uh, tile content can be deduplicated, but also now directory entries can be deduplicated uh, because each entry um, is no longer a ZXY, but a position on a Hilbert curve or a series of Hilbert curves going from, uh, from order zero to order infinite. Um, and you can encode a run length uh, in Hilbert space. So if we look at the, uh, this diagram on the bottom right, um, it shows you a single entry that covers like um, 170,000 different tiles that all have the same value. So that entire segment of the world can be captured by a single uh, very small entry. 
Yep. Um, and this is just a cool visualization of um, all of the oceans or all of the repetitions. So even things like national parks in Canada uh, that have repetitive tiles uh, can be run length encoded. Uh, directory compression. Um, so just to get you an idea of what kind of ratios we get here. Um, so I've been working with this test. Uh, it's a vector basement data set I generated um, from zero to uh, zoom zero to 14. Uh, for V2, the total directory size is about six gigs because um, there's no compression. So after you do a, a couple of uh, delta encoding um, and uh, like variable length integers, row length encoding, you can get it down to 92 megabytes. Um, one thing that I've been working on as of just yesterday is talking to people. Um, question I get is why not just use uh, uh, sort of quad keys, which are the same thing as the order curves or Morton codes. Um, Hilbert is more expensive, um, but has better locality uh, because there's much more continuity. If you're trying to run length encode, you know, a, a continuous uh, sort of area, um, you can find a lot more of those, generally about a 5% improvement. Uh, and if you're using PM tiles, uh, you're probably waiting the most uh, for doing the IO to actually grab the tile over disk or the network. Uh, so the CPU overhead, I think, is negligible. Um, and PM tiles version three will come with a lot more ecosystem tools. Um, so uh, a new uh, standalone binary to do really fast conversion from MB tiles with no installation. The current one is in Python. Um, interactive uh, viewer for PM tiles, uh, whether local or remote. Um, direct output uh, from popular tile generation. Uh, so the tool Tipicanu, if you've used that, um, I'm working on adding PM tiles native support to that, as well as readers and writers in more languages. Uh, so what the PM tiles viewer looks like, uh, this is on GitHub now, but you can load a URL or drag and drop a local file. It works the same way. And get a list of every single tile, um, be able to hover over um, a feature and see its attributes, sort of like a inspector. Um, another new thing um, that I've open sourced recently is uh, serverless function as a service implementation. So if you'd like to adopt PM tiles, but don't want to change your front end, you can simulate um, a ZXY endpoint uh, with no server involved via Lambda or Cloudflare workers. Um, and you can also cache those tiles at the edge. Uh, so it is blazing fast. Um, and uh, the implementation can, uh, can be deployed just by copy and paste. It's a tiny little zip file that's about two kilobytes um, because the spec is so simple. Uh, so you can find that on GitHub. Uh, and you can see um, our previous uh, the spider web of different dependencies is now just S3 and some kind of CDN like Lambda all the way to the browser. Uh, so um, one really great part of this as, as having these open source components is being able to collaborate with people around the world and meet a lot of them for the first time here at Phosphor G. So here's just some of the people that have uh, made commits to any of these three projects. Uh, so I wanted to thank them um, and please talk to me uh, if you're here. Uh, and next steps for me, um, I am in the midst of turning this into a business. Um, so if some part of this or all of it uh, sounds interesting to your organization, um, I am doing commercial support for organizations, um, whether that's developing um, those open source tools more um, or somehow deploying it in your environment, working with your data sets. Um, and here's how to contact me. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Brandon.